Good morning, everyone. It's really, um, it's really an honor and, and joy to be here with all of you. I know that there's a lot of types of special folks in the world, but I think the people who till the soil and know the earth, not in a theoretical way, not in a way where they like tweet about the land, but are actually in it day in and day out and could tell me like what the weather's gonna be tomorrow because it matters and where the moon's at because it really matters to you. Like y'all are my folks. <laughs> so it's really, um, it brings me a deep joy to be here amongst you. Earth keepers, land keepers, water farmers also. So thank you for having me. Really appreciate it. Uh, we're gonna take a little journey today. We're gonna talk a, a bit about history Black farming, racism in the food system, what we're doing about it, what we can do about it, what we all can work together to change, uh, to make it a place where all people can have access to the lands, access to good food, access to good jobs in the food system, which I hope, I hope is something we agree that we all want. Right? You probably got that I'm into ancestors. <laughs> it's very important to me. Um, raise your hand if you got here all by yourself, no one helped you out in any way. All right, so we're on page. All of us have ancestors, mentors, teachers, family, friends who helped us get to where we are in this moment, and we're grateful for them. Um, you already heard me talk about the grandmothers, ancestral grandmothers who braided seeds in their hair before being forced to board transatlantic slave ships, believing against odds in a future on soil. Um, so we, we call them into this space, but I also want to give you a chance to call into the space, an ancestor that's made a sacrifice for you or inspired you in some way, whether that's a blood ancestor, an adopted ancestor. So think of who that person might be. Does anyone know which way east is? Yes. This is the only place where people actually know, right? <laughs> so this is east. Yes. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Through the so if you're able to stand, I'm going to invite you to stand. We're going to face the east, which is the land of the ancestors. Um, and at the count of three, we are going to all in unison and with conviction and with gratitude say the name of the ancestor that we're holding in our heart. One, two, three. Samuel Cornelius Smith. Ashe. You can sit down. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. And of course, we give our, our thanks to the land herself. We give thanks to the Lenape people for stewarding this land. And, and reinstate our commitment to the Lenape people to work for their liberation and rematriation. Our land in particular is on Mohican territory, and specifically the Stockbridge Muncie. We're up in, uh, Soul Fire Farm is up in Grafton, New York, which is about two and a half hours north of here in the cold, snowy mountains. I had to wash snow off my car this morning. And the Mohicans were forced from their territories in the 1800s, first to western New York, then to Wisconsin. And we've been in a learning journey because our whole, our whole group, Soul Fire Farm, there's nine of us. We're pretty much all black, indigenous, Latinx, but none of us are from that land. So we still have settler privi privilege that we're dealing with. And, and we've been in conversation with the Mohican people about how to share the lands and, and doing some legal paperwork right now to make sure they can always have access. Um, which is not sharing to say like, oh, we got it all figured out. We definitely don't. But I think it's important for all of us to be thinking about that because many of us do own land or we're on land and we know people who own land. So be thinking about rematriation. Um, and I also just finally want to call into the room my team because it's never one person you know on a farm you're going to be real depressed and you're going to be burned out very fast if it's just you alone on those acres. And so this is all of us, our farm, farm team, you know, Demaris and Larissa and Letitia, Olive and Ceci, the program team, the infrastructure team, um, all making it happen at Soul Fire. So I want to just shout them out too. So Garvey said, you know, if you don't know your history, you're like a rootless tree. No way you can grow, no way you can spread your branches, no way your leaves can turn green. And so what I want to talk about to start out is this thesis I'll kind of put forth, that the food system is not broken at all. Right? The food system is actually working exactly as it was designed. It was designed to take the land and the resources and the good food and the power away from the masses and concentrate it in the hands of a few folks. And that that's the legacy we're living with. So when we get caught up in a lot of these questions like, oh, why aren't wages good? Or why is good food too expensive? Or how come I can't afford land? It's not just our personal problems. It has to do with a whole structural set of conditions that have been created over time. So we're going to talk about that kind of sad stuff, right? 
Um, and then we'll talk about what we're doing about it, what we can all do about it. So just hang in there. Don't get too depressed or anything like that. Um, because we have to remember that even if, as we talk about this legacy of oppression and theft and all of that, that there's equally been, if not more powerfully, been a legacy of resistance. So my belief personally is that our, our ancestral grandmothers didn't just braid like basil and rice and coffee in their hair. They also braided all of this knowledge about right relationship with the earth, right relationship with community. And for those who are at breakfast, you know, I was talking a little bit about some of those examples in terms of cooperative economics, methods for sharing the land in a land trust model, you know, ways of conserving soil by creating dark earth and terraces. So all of this knowledge about right relationship came with us too. And there's been earth warriors all the way through remembering to pluck these seeds out of their hair in the face of the empire. You know, but the whole colonial project had a different idea for us, right? And it wasn't about preserving those seeds. It started with this concept. Does anyone know what this um, image represents? Manifest, Manifest destiny. destiny. Yeah, what is that? Exactly, exactly. So to repeat what the brother said, essentially manifest destiny is this incorrect notion that white settlers have like a God-given right to colonize the whole continent. Um, and this didn't start in the 1800s when this image was created. It actually started in 1455 with Pope Nicholas. He wrote a papal decree that said that white Christian nations should go forth and enslave, colonize, and pillage all non-Christian nations. This was the beginning of the Age of Discovery, the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria, all that stuff, right? So that came out of the Catholic Church before it was any government. But it's not, it didn't end in the 1400s, of course. It became part of U.S. property law. It's affectionately termed finder's keeper's law if you go to property law school to be a lawyer. Because in 1823, the Supreme Court in the McIntosh decision upheld this idea of the doctrine of discovery, which essentially says indigenous people, non-Christian people, don't really have a right to their land. We consider them domestic dependent nations who can occupy with permission but cannot own. So if a white Christian plants a flag somewhere, and you see us doing this all over the place, on the moon, in the South Pole, right? Then there's this ownership and right to exclude. So 1823, Doctrine of Discovery, Indian removal, all that stuff. The Supreme Court kept upholding this, though, all the way until the most recent time was 2005 when the Oneida Nation in western New York sued the town to get some of its land back. And they said, oh, no, no, I'm sorry. White folks found that land. It's not yours anymore. So if you're not familiar with Doctrine of Discovery, it's very important to look at because that whole history of dispossession is not over. It's not like this ground was ever ceded without force right, and trickery. This ground is still stolen ground that we're on right now, and probably that most of us are on. Unless you are indigenous to the actual area where you are farming, you're probably on stolen land. So stolen land was, is the DNA of the U.S. food system, plus one other ingredient. And that one other ingredient is stolen and exploited labor. Right. Does anyone know what this image represents? You do. Yes, the slave trade, right? Twelve and a half million African people, farmers, kidnapped from Central and Western Africa um, to work without pay and without freedom of movement on plantations in the American South, the Caribbean, South America. And we, we've all heard, we all know about this, you know, the $10 trillion of wealth that was created and never repaid also by our black ancestors. What a lot of folks don't know is that these were agricultural experts, right? They weren't just kidnapped for their brawn. Because Europeans, what, what was the climate in Europe? Most of Europe. Like yeah, exactly. It's temperate or it's, um, cold. it's cold, right? But in the south of the United States and in Haiti and in Cuba and in Brazil, it's tropical. It's, it's subtropical. It's much more similar to the climates of the western region of Africa. And so they need to find folks who know how to farm, how to farm rice. That rice doesn't grow in England, right? And so, I mean, you can now. Yes, certain varieties, I understand. But, but the, point being that, <laughs> the point being that slavers intentionally kidnapped the most skilled agriculturalists. And so this, this was uh, decimated the farming community on the continent, as well as having impact for the people who were kidnapped themselves. But then we were good, right, after 1865? No more stolen land, no more stolen labor. It's all good now, right? What happened in 1865? Yes. Civil War ends, Emancipation Proclamation, 13th Amendment to the Constitution, which says what? 
Slavery is abolished, except, except if you've been convicted of a crime. If you haven't seen the documentary 13th, definitely check that out because it lays it out. But there's an exception clause in the 13th Amendment, it's called 13th, um, that says that you can still be enslaved if you've been convicted of a crime. Why did they put this exception in? Give you a sense. Prior to 1865, the prisons were almost entirely filled with white folks. After 1865, the prisons were almost entirely filled with black folks. And it's not because black people suddenly just went nuts and started like raping and pillaging at all. It's because a system called convict leasing came into be. And that is when the state would lease out prisoners back to the plantation, the coal mines, the railroads, in order to keep the economic engine of the South working after slavery. So how'd they get the prisons to be filled with black people? The black codes. A whole new set of laws came onto the books. Loitering became a crime. Loitering means hanging around, right? Vagrancy, not having a job, not getting off the sidewalk for a white person, not taking off your hats, not following church procedures, not refusing to be tied like a hog. These became crimes across the South that could get you incarcerated. And this wasn't a footnote in history. Alabama, in the late 1960s, 73% of their state budget came from leasing out black people back to the plantation. So this was a significant thing that was going on in the South. And at the same time, folks who weren't getting thrown into prison, most of them stayed on the plantation. Why on earth would you stay on the plantation after you were free? Any ideas? You don't know where else to go. Exactly. 40 acres and a mule didn't happen. That was actually an idea that came out of the black church. Black church met with, um, there were 30, led by Garrison Frazier, there were 30 ministers who went to talk with um, the Union Army and said to, to General Sherman, you know, we need this land and we need some autonomy because it's going to take a whole generation for white folks to sort of cycle out of their prejudice. So we want our autonomous communities. They were into the idea, started getting land. But when Jackson became president, he reversed that order. So there was no 40 acres and a mule. So you don't have any lands, you don't have any money. And, and so the system of sharecropping came to be, which is you stay on the plantation, your house, your tools, your mule, everything is owned by your former so-called owner. Um, and then you work and give the share of the crop. It was a debt peonage system. It was an entrapment system um, that led to, to really severe poverty. In fact, so severe that a disease that's almost never seen in the world called pellagra, it's a niacin deficiency, was replete uh, for folks who were living in these conditions because they were literally starving. They were not getting basic nutrition. Despite all this, which completely astounds me, by 1910, black farmers had saved enough of their Sunday money from working seven days a week and renting themselves out on Sunday to do some carpentry, do some shoe repair, horseshoes, things like that, to purchase 15 plus million acres of land across the South. That was 14% of the nation's farmland. Totally astounding. The white plantation owners freaked out. And what did they do when they freaked out? They created white terrorism in this way, in this particular incarnation. So we had over 4,000 lynchings take place in the South, many of which targeted black landowners for the audacity of getting off of the sharecropping, tenant farming system. One example of this. Um, in 1908 in Hinkman, Kentucky, this was the peak of the lynchings that were happening. In 1908, um, Mr. Walker was on his 2.5 acre parcel, black farmer, with his six children and his wife. The KKK comes up and tells him to come outside for a whipping and he refuses. So the mob shoots at the house and sets it on fire. And they all run out. One of the children never escapes the burning house. His wife comes out with a baby in arms. You know, they all die except for one person in that family. Mr. Walker dies defending his farm, the children die, the wife die. And so they took his land, sold it to a neighbor, and when the Associated Press did an investigation of this and about 400 other examples of land theft, they found that that neighbor's daughter just owns the land today. Right? So in this way, you know, we talk about the Great Migration when six million black people moved from the south to the north and it was the age of opportunity and the factories. What's often not talked about is that it was actually a refugee crisis because people were getting forced off their land by racial terrorism. So there was a labor vacuum. Black folks were leaving. And the United States had an opportunity to have this moment where they could say, you know, that whole stolen land, exploited labor thing, let's be done with that. Let's move forward. 
but they didn't. They had to find another population to exploit. Any idea what started happening in the early 1900s? Exactly. Yeah. Filipino, Mexican workers, other Southeast Asian, Caribbean workers through the Bracero program and many incarnations of the guest worker program. Right? And so that's when folks who are born outside of the so-called borders of this country are invited on these very specific contract visas, often to do labor that U.S. citizens will not be willing to do. You know, take, for example, a friend of mine who works at a land-grant university in the Midwest, you know, room full of students, aspiring farmers, and ask them, how much would you need to be paid to work at the meat packing plant in town? Any idea what they said? How much would you want to be paid to work at the meat packing plant? 3,000 ho hogs an hour? They couldn't pay you. They couldn't pay you. That's exactly what 100% of his students said. You could not pay me enough to work there. It's dangerous. It's grueling. You're going to get repetitive stress, injuries. You have to kill those animals so fast, the blood, the stench, the disease, all that stuff. And you like, could not pay me enough. And by the way, it's Mexican work is what they said. So we have to ask ourselves, we created a food system that can only run if we create such conditions of desperation that indigenous people have to leave their homelands, leave their families because of economic pressures, climate pressures, unfair trade agreements, come to a hostile land to work in despicable conditions that probably none of us are willing to work in for sub-minimum wage, right? Without proper labor protections. And that's like the, the fuel of the food system. And that's baked right into the law. Right? So in 1935, something really important happened for workers in this country. Any idea? FDR. What is that? The New Deal. The New Deal package. You get Social Security, you get labor protections, child labor, the right to unionize, all this whole package of laws uh, between like 33 and 38. But in order to get the Southern Democratic bloc to vote for this package of legis legislation, they had to put an exclusion clause in there that basically said, if you're an agricultural worker or a domestic worker, you do not get these benefits. That's the only way the Southern Democrats would vote. And the parties were switched back then, right? Um, and all the agricultural and domestic workers, by and large, were black and brown people. So a generation later, Social Security was given to everyone. But if you look today at the Fair Labor Standards Act and the National Labor Relations Act, there's still the exclusion clause. So that's why you can be 12 and drop out of school and work out a farm. That's why if you have a farm with less than seven people, there's no federal minimum wage at all. That's why farm workers don't have a right to a day off in seven or overtime pay or the right to unionize the way that other US workers do. It's a completely separate set of legislation that basically says to the people who work the land, Unless you own it, you actually don't have value as a human being beyond the product that we can extract from you. And so at the same time as this was happening and labor was shifting over to the Bracero H2, H2 program, black farmers were trying desperately to hold on to their land in the South. But it wasn't just the KKK and the White Citizens Council and all of that um, attacking them. There was also the federal government itself. In 1962, the U.S. Commission of Civil Rights said the federal government, the USDA, was the number one driver of black land loss and would have the blood on its hands of the extinction of the black farmer. And this was because, and still is, the, the USDA doles out its resources at the county level. There's these elections. If you're not involved, you should get involved, right? It's county committees. And they decide, you know, oh, you can have a loan here, um, a crop allotment, some insurance, some technical assistance, a university, all of these things that farmers come to rely upon because it is a highly subsidized sector. But black folks weren't getting this. They weren't getting it anyway, but then when the civil rights movement hit, that USDA program became sharpened into a weapon to punish civil rights activity. Oh, Mr. Brown, you applied for a loan. Did I hear that you went down and registered to vote today? Oh, well, I can't seem to find your application. I'm so sorry. Why don't you come back tomorrow? Right. Check out Pete Daniels' book, Dispossession, which documents this. And these farmers actually sued the government and won the largest civil rights settlement in U.S. history in 1999, the Pigford v. Glickman case, which then spawned a whole bunch of other people suing the U.S. government, Native Americans and women and Latinx folks for discrimination. Right. And I just did an investigation of the stats in 2015, and we still haven't fixed it. White farmers are still getting way more of these federal resources than farmers of color. 
Pigford versus Glickman. You got it. Chapter 15, too. <laughs> All proceeds go to black farmer training, so it's not even for me. Um, and then in the north, you know, racism's like a little different. It's kind of sneaky and stuff. Like in the south, they'll just tell you, right? But in the north, you're like, what's wrong with me? I don't understand why they don't like me. So in the north, you know, folks wanted to get land too. Obviously, we want to own our own homes. We want our gardens. We want good schools for our children. So folks are coming up north, and they encounter an entirely different form of this disparity in terms of access to property. It's called redlining. Okay, so this also started in the 1930s. The federal government commissioned these maps to be made that ranked neighborhoods from most desirable to least desirable to lend to. And the neighborhoods that were the worst, which were the black neighborhoods, got outlined in red. That's why it's called redlining. And as an aside, I went on Zillow recently, which is like that homeowner site thing. They still outline them in red. That's so illegal. But check it out. They literally outline these names. My mouth was down. Like, <laughs> so what happens? So what? It's outlined in red. Well, what happens is that a bank will not give you a mortgage. How many people have enough money to just buy a house out of pocket with no mortgage? Be honest, at least one of you does. <laughs> okay, maybe none of you do. But you need, you need a mortgage, right? You need, you need to lend. So if you can't get a mortgage, you can't own property. The number one way that wealth is passed down in this country, right, is through property. In fact, 80% of the wealth in this whole nation is inherited. You don't build it up in your lifetime. It comes from your parents, your grandparents, right? When I was born, according to the Pew Research Center, back in 1980, give you a sense of how old I was. The, the white to black wealth gap was eight to one. Last year it was 16 to one, doubled in my lifetime. And so that wealth is just concentrating, concentrating. And it's not about wages, it's about property. When folks got home from World War II, there was the GI Bill that said all veterans, you can get these 0% mortgages and the government will foot the bill. Of the 67,000 mortgages given out, 90 went to people of color. So the reason that we have the wealth gap is not because black folks are not industrious and we don't want to own and we don't know how to save. It's because there was white affirmative action from jump. And there was discrimination in terms of redlining, which exists to this day. Try to buy a house in Detroit. I don't care if you're making $200,000, you will not get a mortgage in the boundary of Detroit because the, the banks won't lend to you. And this doesn't Im just impact the farmers and landowners. It obviously impacts the consumers too. Because if we got good food, like, then we can learn and we can resist and we can go to City Hall and we can get involved. You know, if we're overweight and we get diabetes and heart disease and hunger and obesity in our children, we don't know where the next meal is going to come from, that's going to keep us very distracted from participating in civic life. So I believe that food has been weaponized, right? So this young person here is relying on the emergency food system to get basic needs, and that is the case for one in three black children in this country. One in three will go to bed hungry tonight. One in three rely on emergency food to meet their basic caloric intake. So we have everything. As my daughter says, the food system is everything it takes to get sunshine onto our plates. So the sunshine is still good, right? But once it hits the earth, basically from the land all the way to the plates, we have this structural injustice, this structural racism, where you have, you have this stolen land, right? Almost all the land in the concentration of European folks. According to the USDA, over 95% of the rural lands in the hands of European folks. That's more than it's ever been in the last 150 years, right? That's worse. We have exploited labor. Over 80% of the folks, I will, over 80% over of the folks who grow our food are Latinx, Hispanic, and so forth, yet only 2% of the farm managers and owners are Latinx, Hispanic, and it impacts the consumer as well. So all throughout the system, there you go, you wanted that one. It's on my website, too, if you want to check it out. And then, of course, is the earth herself. And you know I love the earth. You all love the earth. But we have to look at not just how this all impacts the human community, but industrial ag is like the number one driver of climate change, the number one driver of land loss, the number one driver of water withdrawals. Like California is literally sinking as the aquifers get drained for our almond milk. You know, these are things we need to look at. And, and we've known. And 70% of the world still knows how to grow food in a way that honors community and honors the earth. But when we pay attention to it, it's usually just to appropriate it. It's not really to honor it, and to systematize it so we can make that change. So we're going to talk about what to do about it and what's being done. But first, I just want to give a chance for folks to, two minutes, 
to turn to the person next to you, and please really do it, because this is not outside of you, it's inside of you, um, and talk about how were your ancestors connected to these past events? Like, where were they in the history? Where do you see your people? Okay, so find a partner. One minute each, <laughs> tell them a story. <laughs> So switch if you haven't switched yet. All right, we're going to bring it back. When I say free the people, you say free the land, free the people. When I say free the people, you say free the land, free the people. When I say free the people, you say free the land, free the people. All right, repeat after me. When I say free the people, you say free the land, free the people. Free the land. There we go. All right, can we have a couple people share out something that was alive for you in your conversation? And if it's about the other person, just get their consent. Uh, but we'd, we'd love to hear a few examples of how we're connected to this story. Native, but I have a lot of people from West India, um, and he's mixed with the native, but he has a lot of people from Puerto Rico, so we, we, we uh, connect with him a lot of things. You know, one of the things he brought up that was interesting is that if you ask a lot of colored people like what they are, they'll just say they're black or African American and not even know too much about their descent and uh, how there is a lot of native mix in there, but a lot of people don't even connect with uh, who they really are because they don't know. A lot of Native Americans won't say I'm, I'm Native. Like, my people are Native American. A lot of them I ask, oh, what are you? I'm black. Yep. You know? A lot I'm of gonna repeat that just so folks over here can hear you. But basically they're saying, like, between the two of them, they have um, heritage from the black American South, from Puerto Rico, other places in the West Indies, including a lot of Native American heritage. But a lot of times folks will identify as black and either not know about Native heritage or kind of just not talk about their Native heritage. So thank you. Someone else? Um, I was talking about, um, my, my people are from Puerto Rico as well, and my grandfather was a farmer and left all, his, all everything behind because he came out of industrial, industrialization and he didn't want to have dirty hands anymore. It was these big campaigns about not having dirty hands. So he left all his land behind and brought like all of his resources because he thought he could come to America to buy land here. And so they ended up living in the Bronx and that's obviously a redlining district. So he never purchased them. So we own no land here. Mm. So 
So the only way he was able to purchase was once he died back in Thank you. So the story is that. What pronouns do you use? She? Sorry? Do you use she or pronouns? She. Okay. Uh, so she was saying that her dad um, was a farmer in Puerto Rico and sort of bought this whole campaign about, you know, stop getting your hands dirty, moved up to the Bronx, hoping to buy land, couldn't get land in a redlining district, couldn't own anything till going back to Puerto Rico. Like, after he died, your family got the land? After or? my grandmother died. After grandmother died. Yeah. Thank you. Let's hear one more story. Yeah, go ahead. I was told by my partner that uh, her family, way back like in Germany, her past generations actually were farming on land that wasn't theirs. So that was cool. And for me, I am one of those people where I, my family does not tell me anything. I really don't know my background. I just know that my grandfather was full blood Native American. So that's cool. Wow. <laughs> wow. So between the two of them, we have in Germany farming on land that's not their own mm -hmm. and being full-blooded native two generations ago. Awesome. <laughs> thank you. And I think it's important too when we think about how we're connected to these past events to think about stories of ways our ancestors certainly were harmed by this, but also complicity. Like, I identify as black and native, that's how I walk through the world. And also, I have a lineage that was, was English that arrived here in the 1600s, like, killed the whales almost to extinction, helped to found Braintree Mass, and drove the Mashpee Wampanoag off their land, right? And so it's important to recognize all of those and all of us, and not to make anybody like feel bad or that it's about shame, but it is about responsibility and accountability, which starts with just telling the truth, you know, and we can move from there. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit about what we're up to as Soul Fire to try to address these issues and how that connects to this legacy of resistance and the seeds in the hair. And then, you know, hopefully we'll have a really rich and live discussion about what y'all are doing and what we can continue to move forward from here. There's a beautiful teaching in the Talmud, I'm also Jewish, um, through marriage that in Pirkei Avot that says, we are not obligated to complete the task, but neither are we free to desist from it. So this is like big problems, like a whole, you know, continent of stolen land and all this stuff. And, and it, we could get very, very overwhelmed, but we just have to remember, like if our great, great, great grandmas could put seeds in their hair and believe as they were crossing that huge ocean with no report backs, in, they believed in a future, they believed in us. Like we can't give up on our descendants. So, so we need to do something about it. Empress, yes. Yes, from Pirkei Avot. Yes. We are not obligated to complete the task, but neither are we free to desist from it. So our little slice of not desisting is about self-determination through food. As Fannie Lou Hamer said, if you have 400 quarts of greens and gumbo soup canned for the winter, nobody can push you around or tell you what to do. So we use the food and land as a means of self-sufficiency. Our farm has three main projects that we work on. The first is our survival program, the second is our training, and the third is reparations. And when I say stone one, two, and three, there's a beautiful Krobo proverb. I spent a lot of time in Ghana um, with the queen mothers, and they say, latte ete no no da. It means three stones hold the cooking pot firmly and balanced. And so we're always talking about the three aspects of what we do. So the first stone of our cooking pot is literally feeding people in the soil. We do that through Ujamaa farm share. Ujamaa means cooperative economics. It means non-exploitative economic relationship. So we grow mad food, we box it up every Wednesday in the back of the delivery van and bring it to the doorstep of 100 families, about 350 individuals throughout the capital district and we deliver in zip codes that the USDA terms food deserts. As Mama Karen has taught us, food desert is not the appropriate term, it is food apartheid. It is a human created system of segregation that relegates our people to food scarcity. It is not a natural biome that belongs, that just arose out of nowhere, right? So it's food apartheid. And we do all this on a sliding scale, so people pay whatever they can afford, and including a handful of families who receive totally free shares not because the farmer is not getting paid, which is very important, the farmer needs to get paid, it's because their neighbors who have more resources are buying the food for them. And all our solidarity shares go to refugees, immigrants, and people who have an incarcerated loved one. This is an example of the bounty. Um, but of course, like, we didn't come up with this idea, right, of, <laughs> Oh, we're going to like feed the community. What a cool idea. And sometimes we get in that weird frontier mentality where we think we're coming up with something new. 
No, we're, we're copying, copying these folks, right? We're copying the Black Panthers, the free breakfast program, 20,000 children fed every morning in Oakland, California. They had clinics, they were providing transportation, they were providing groceries. Yes, they were doing armed self-defense, but the majority of their resources, you know, we're going to keep in their community sustained at a basic level. And this is so important because, I mean, maybe not for y'all, but a lot of times in the left, we get into this armchair Twitter activism, and I think it's kind of bullshit. It's like, what are you actually doing? You're like critiquing things? Okay. And like, so what's the alternative? Like, let's actually build something together. So it's very important to us that no matter what we're doing, that there's a foundation of here's what it could look like. And we're actually showing that it can work. And not trashing the planet in the process, you know? When we got our land, we didn't have no money. So we got like the cheapest piece of marginal, degraded logs, hillside. So you like put a shovel in it and you hit hard pan that far down the shovel. Like that's, that's what the soil was. And we're like, it's amazing. <laughs> like we can do anything. And all the farmers down the hill, like these fools will never grow vegetables. But you know, we used the techniques of our ancestors and a lot of patience and a lot of grit built up that soil. I just recently read this incredibly tragic statistic that um, in the first generation of settlers coming to the Midwest and taking the plow to the Great Plains, 50% of the carbon in the soil, the organic matter, was released. So it went from 9.5% OM to about 4% in one generation. So organic matter is life. And the opposite of that is climate change. So if you look at the climate change, uh, the CO2 graphs, the first spike of anthropogenic climate change was the opening of the plains. Fascinating. So we see our job when we say we're going to re-indigenize the soil or decolonize the soil. It's about calling the carbon back in, calling the life back in. So I mentioned some of the techniques, you know, and you all know about this, like raised beds and cover crop, you know all that stuff. But probably the most important technology to call life back into the soil is what the grandmas in Ghana taught me. And this was a challenge. They called me in one day to like the compound because they like to see like what's going on in the United States. They think it's hilarious. They're like, is it true that like the wife will be stirring the, the pot of soup and the husband will be tasting at the same time? They're like, <laughs> always like, is it really true? So this time they were like, okay, Amida Day, we have the next question. Is it really true that in the United States, the farmers will plant the seed and they will not pray? They will not pour libation. They will not dance. They will not give any thanks. And then they expect it to grow. <laughs> Is that really, can it be true? And they're like waiting. So I'm like cover my face. Damn, it's true. <laughs> we did that. And they're like, no wonder y'all are sick. <laughs> so here we are looking like fools, but we're taking their advice. Like you got to dance, you got to sing, you got to give thanks. The earth is alive, right? Earth is alive. But we didn't come up with this idea either. You know, I mentioned Watley and Carver, so many other black farmer innovators who people thought were totally out of their minds. They're saying, no, don't monocrop. You know, we need to instead have these diversified systems. Dr. Carver, one of my most fam one of the essays I love of his the most is from a speech that he was giving to a group of, of black farmers. And he said, basically, y'all are lazy because after your harvest in the fall, you think you're done and you can rest. But you can't rest. This is the time to go to the swamps and pull out the muck and the weeds and go to the forest and pull out the leaves and you're going to pile them up and then the, they'll decompose and you'll have this black gold and you'll spread it on your fields. And they're like, you're totally nuts, right? But like, what is the number one thing that organic farmers were just like, compost? People thought Watley was nuts too because he was like, all right, I know y'all are not making any money on your farms, but I have this idea. We're going to get all these city folk to like join your farm. They're going to be members, okay? And you're going to make a newsletter that you send out every week with like updates so they feel connected to the farm. And then you'll invite them to come out on the weekend and they're going to pick the crops for you and pay you to pick the crops. And I think we're going to call it something like pick your own. You know, that's what we're going to call it. How many people have ever done like apple picking? So, <laughs> right. So real innovators, real contributors to the field. So again, we're not just like making it up. The second thing that we're up to is, is farmer training. Um, sadly, it's very, very difficult to get training as a farmer if you don't already have access to family wealth. Because so many of the apprenticeships and learning opportunities require you to essentially forego like a livable wage so that you can learn on someone else's land for a amount of time. And that's just not feasible for many people. And also can be outright dangerous. Like we've had a lot of folks 
black folks telling us, oh, I did that willing workers on organic farms or worldwide, whatever they're calling it now, the WOOF program. And I'd be like trapped in the middle of nowhere. It's like really racist territory. Folks are riding up on me, threatening me. I can't get out because I don't have a car. You know, so people were like, you need to start a farm program where you can protect us and have cultural relevance. So we started Black Latinx Farmers Immersion. I put a Facebook post out, and the first week-long session filled in a day. I put another one out, it filled in a day. We have a waiting list two years long for people who want to come anywhere from a 50-hour intensive to a full season apprenticeship. So when people are like, black and brown folks don't want to farm, it's not true. Like, we are the returning generation. Our grandparents fled the red clays of Georgia. You know, as Chris Bolden Newsom would say, the land was the scene of the crime. So our grandparents fled. But we're realizing this generation, the land was never the criminal. In fact, the land is that source of healing that we need. It's a source of self-determination that we need. And Fannie Lou Hamer knew this. You know, the charades, they knew this. They started, the, the charades started the first ever community land trust in the United States, 1969. New communities in Albany, Georgia had almost 6,000 acres shared by families, and they were training up farmers. You know, they were building housing. They were providing safe haven. I mentioned Fannie Lou Hamer at breakfast from Freedom Farm. She had 70 families, and she was providing the scholarships and the burial fees and all of this. So this idea of like community-based farming, where we're passing that knowledge on to the next generation, our ancestors have been doing it. It's one of our graduates. She's dope. She was going to quit farming, and then it's like, I'm not. I'm going to replicate DLFI in Atlanta. So <laughs> I'm just going to skip a few so we can get to the conversation part. But um, the third thing that we're up to is the reparations and movement work. Um, and this is where a lot of you all come in, because a lot of you were involved in this. But it came out of, like, I thought we were amazing and, like, busy, because we had these youth programs. We were doing, like, diversion to keep youth out of prison. We were feeding mad people. We are training farmers, like, doing the most community days, workshops on how to plant garlic. And um, then this elder came to visit us maybe three, four years ago, uh, Baba Curtis Muhammad. He's a civil rights veteran who actually fled the United States to go live in Brazil because of the terror. And so he comes with his long white beard and his like all white Arisha clothes from Brazil and he's sitting at my table. He's like, you know, Leah, there would be no civil rights movement without the black farmers. And I'm not exaggerating because no restaurant, no hotel, no cobbler, no library would have put up those rabble rousing activists so they could do their work. The only way they could do their work is when the black farmers opened up their homes and had Bible study, right? Where they'd have the Bibles with the register to vote pamphlets tucked inside so you could organize. And if people peered in the window, it looked like you were just having a good Christian evening. Right? Those same black farmers, when the night Riders would come and try to pick up the activists and lynch them, carry them off and throw them in the river, they literally cut down trees to block the roads to keep the night Riders out. They leveraged their land as collateral to bail people out of prison. And perhaps most importantly, because they weren't tenant farmers and couldn't get kicked off their lands, they were the first in line to register to vote, to sign a petition, to join the NAACP. So quite literally, land-owning black farmers were the backbone, the foundation of the civil rights movement. So Baba Muhammad was like, so what you doing? <laughs> you got land. <laughs> what you doing? So we started trying to be more explicit about, you know, Real systems change. Obviously, you've got to feed people. You've got to train people. But if you train up folks and they can't get any land, or you feed folks and then the winter time comes and, and your food is gone, you know, you haven't fundamentally changed the system. So we started doing more of like policy platforms, uprooting racism training, reparations work. Our alumni built this reparations map that matches people with resources to black and brown farmers who need a tractor or they need some land, right, to support them with their next steps. And we started working with Mama Karen's group with Bugs, with the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, the Heal Food Alliance, to actually take the concerns of black and brown farmers and turn them into policy platforms that can be championed at the federal level. And some of the most exciting and challenging organizing of my life <laughs> has been the regional work we're doing with indigenous communities to form a black indigenous land trust that will encourage reparations, gifts of land to be shared by these communities all across New England and New York. We're about to hopefully Sunday confirm our co-coordinators, launch this project in early 2019 officially. It's very, very exciting work, very challenging work. And we're building off you know, the work of the Immokalee workers, the United Farm Workers in this organizing. And then the last thing I'll mention is um, 
before we get to the conversation is just that these borders, like we can't buy into them too much, right? And so one of the ways that we discipline ourselves not to buy into the borders too much is to make sure that every year, every winter, we are supporting a sibling farm that's also part of Via Campesina, the, the international grassroots peasant movement with whatever it is they need. So like in two weeks, I'm gonna be in Vieques, I think of Conciencia helping them with their land trust work. We're in, yeah, we're in Haiti, uh, where my family's from, you know, every year for seven years, post earthquake, post hurricane, helping with reforestation and whatever projects. We don't tell them what to do, obviously. We just go and support them. And that's very important to have this like farmer to farmer type of work in exchange. So I would love to open it up and just have a conversation with y'all, questions, thoughts about what it is that we can do. We have a lot of political power, a lot of land power, a lot of genius in this room. Uh, but to have a brief conversation about what it is that we can do to really support the type of change that we want to see. And I'm going to seed that conversation with um, a few ideas, and then we're going to take it from there. So first and most importantly, if you take one thing out of this, it's this. If we're talking about racism, we need to listen to the people who are impacted by racism. If we're talking about anti-Semitism, we need to listen to the people impacted by anti-Semitism. Talking about farming, we got to listen to farmers, right? That all makes sense, because those are the people who know intimately the issue. But unfortunately, what we have going on most of the time is folks who are not being impacted by those issues going into communities with their own ideas, call it the frontier mentality, or the white savior complex. I know what y'all need. You need cooking classes so you can figure out how to cook, right? Or, I know what y'all need. You need a community garden right here where I decided it was, and so come on over. And why are you coming to the meetings? What's wrong with y'all? You're not motivated, right? And so if we're talking about uprooting racism and injustice in the food system, it's really about taking the lead of community. And that might not be glamorous. You might ask a community group, what can I do? And they're like, childcare. You know, great. Thank you for the opportunity. The second thing is we need to keep self-educating, right? We need to be learning about these issues and being informed about the issues. And the third is there's specific policies that have to be changed. And we don't have to make up what these are. You know, Soul Fire Farm, the Heal Food Alliance, many other organizations have taken the time to listen to black and brown farmers and earth keepers and say, what needs to change? And so we built a platform that has like, you know, 100 things that need to change. And so if you vote, you know someone who votes, you can talk to them about advocating for this stuff, like fair treatment for farm workers, air property protection so we don't lose our lands, fixing immigration law, guaranteeing access to SNAP, and so forth. And to super duper emphasize the fact that it's already happening, we're gonna do a little call and response, okay? So these are all organizations that are black and brown led who are doing food justice work. And there's like hundreds more, but we're gonna start with these. So here's how it goes. I'll say I have a shout, and then you all say out. So I have a shout. Out. I'll say the name of an organization, and then we'll all say may your strength be strengthened, okay? I have a shout. Out. For the US Food Sovereignty Alliance. May, May your strength, strength be strengthened. strengthened. I have a shout, shout for the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. May, May your strength, strength be strengthened. strengthened. I have a shout, shout for SAFON. May your strength be strengthened. I have a shout out. for Familias Unidas, Unidas por la Justicia. May, May your strength, strength be strengthened. I have a shout out. for the Indigenous Youth Council. May, May your strength, strength be strengthened. strengthened. I have a shout out. for the Federation of Southern Cooperatives. May your strength be strengthened. I have a shout out. for the black urban growers. May, May your strength be strengthened. I have a shout out. for the Heal Food Alliance. May, May your strength be strengthened. I have a shout out. for the Native Land Conservancy. May, May your strength be strengthened. be strengthened. So now if you know another black indigenous people of color led farming food project, you can say, I have a shout. Out. So on like that. Can I do it? Yeah. Out. out for Green City Forest. May, May your strength, strength be strengthened. I have a shout. Out. out. Peace Garden and Farm. May, May your strength, strength be strengthened. I have a shout. Out. out. For Angozi. May, May your strength, strength be strengthened. I have a shout. Out. out. For Fresh Future Farm. May, May your strength be strengthened. Out. May your strength be strengthened. Out. out for the full flower farm. 
May your strength be strengthened. Out. May your strength be strengthened. I have a shout. Out. For all y'all. <laughs> May your strength be strengthened. I was trying to change it up because everyone was like reading. I was like, we messed them up. <laughs> and here's just some names and faces to go with some of these organizations. I'm very honored that Mama Karen is in the room. Baba Malik farming seven acres in Detroit and running a co-op and Food Policy Council. Dennis Derrick, who's involved in getting 80,000 people food in the Bronx by aggregating from Schoharie County farmers. Mama Gail, who just joined our board, which I'm so honored, but um, farmer in Oakland, market, and so on and so forth, and many, many, many more. So don't let them tell us, like, you don't belong in the movement, you haven't shown up, you haven't contributed. It's happening. It's just that we have to get beyond the idea of inviting people to our table, so to speak, and really thinking about meeting folks at the table that's already set or setting a new table together, right, on equal terms. So I'm going to leave this up for a minute. What I would love right now is for you to, again, turn to your partner and talk about, again, just a couple minutes and then we'll share out, but talk about what it is that you are currently doing or can do to advance this idea of food sovereignty in the community. Okay? What are you already doing or what can you do to advance this idea of food sovereignty in the community? So find your partner. Talk to your partner. That was fun. <laughs> All right.
<laughs> I wish I could do that whole step thing, but I can't. Um, so let's, let's talk. What y'all come up with? Who wants to share? Mm -hmm. And speak up just kind of loud as people are like that. My friend Justin over here, he's uh, working in New York City housing developments, putting uh, farms in there for people to see that are like all living in the apartments. They can look out the window and start selling this food and then make it accessible to the people in those developments, uh, which I think is really cool. And they're spreading all over New York City. Uh, so I'm excited to see what happens with this. Uh, William. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, my friend William, uh, he, he just shared with me that uh, he kind of reaches out to uh, people trying to teach them um, how to grow what he's growing, even if they can't afford to come out and um, learn, uh, can't afford to come out, fly out, whatever. He'll offer them ways, you know, I'll help you, I'll give you something to stay, uh, somewhere to stay. Also, uh, office classes and um, education and one thing he does um, that's very impressive is whenever he has like people taking his classes he goes out of his way make sure they have housing make sure they have food make sure they have everything they need to uh, be sustainable while they're learning uh, and experiencing the things he do which is very um, very impressive <laughs> I was very impressed and uh, appreciated. She has a farm to school, farm to school program, and I appreciate it a lot because she's working with elementary students and providing food, lunch, uh, services like that, and also teaching them how to farm and uh, basically healthy practices. And I just love that because my brothers and sisters, I don't even think they know they're recycling, but they do it already. So. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, today I was uh, part of a farm that will hopefully be returning to a farmer's market. Uh, Just pick up a little like Facebook oh, yeah. more. Today is, is part of a farm that will hopefully be returning to a farmer's market this spring in Chicago that uh, can match uh, SNAP and EBT dollars. So that's really important for a lot of people. It's really great. The farmers markers are able to get grants that can do that. Well, um, I'm with Fresh Future Farm, so we already um, our people who didn't have land found land and started working right in the middle of a residential neighborhood. And the way that we work is um, we we started you know building this farm space. And we hire people in the neighborhood to train them to, to operate. And then we have an on-site grocery store. So um, you know, people have access to food. But what my 19-year-old my son farm manager suggested that we add to that is um, Saturday bo box boxes like you're all doing for the, the guys that are playing basketball right next door to us. And having, you know, because there's uh, something that goes on next door where people are giving away produce, but their produce doesn't taste as good as ours. <laughs> we have lots of our stuff to go with what they get, and then working with some some clients who came to us with um, uh, chronic illness to make sure that they get what they need. And we're already sort of um, incorporating prioritization and moves into what we do. Thank I think 
for me as, as a writer, it matters a lot to be the one to write our own stories. And I was just thinking about like Phyllis Wheatley, you know, the first American published black poet whose book had to be forwarded by a, a white man. And I think like a lot of times we are always waiting for like a mainstream media to be the ones to tell our stories, even when the work is BIPOC led. And so I think about like your book and I think about my work and people's work and being like, how can we also be the narrators around the work that we're doing and like what is the utility of having um, you know, large scale magazines and publications narrate us versus like is it more valuable to be to be writing our own blogs, right? Or like just thinking about what our communication economies look like. And so um, I know most of us are growers, but I think also how can we be like growers and also be like voices of what we are doing. Yeah, we'll take two more comments. I just wanted to uh, add to what you were saying because um, I do feel like it's important that uh, as uh, uh, as farmers, we should be telling our own story. We shouldn't uh, we shouldn't rely on an outside source or anything like that. But also, that's why I feel like people like you, who's um, writers, and people who I met yesterday, who's in the media and stuff like that. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm make sure I'm not saying his name wrong. I think Mr. Strickland out in California, I think his name is. Um, he found a patch, of, he, there was a patch of grass not used in front of his house. He started growing. And you know, you know the story, he started growing. No, oh, someone else. Okay. Yeah, he, start, he started um, growing right there. And um, he received a bunch of backlash, like it was illegal, like it was a crime, you know what I mean? Um, it's just for the people. So how dare you um, try to put someone away for feeding people, for feeding the community? And that's why I think it's uh, very important to keep that record because you see the effect that it takes on the people around you. And um, I feel like that will domino effect into something much bigger that um, all as farmers we could uh, be a part of together. Not only in the farming part, but the writing part, the media part, and telling our own story. Um, just to, to further on the last two comments in terms of telling your own story and the impact of policy, I work in the policy space and I, I want to encourage everybody who's here to, to, to really engage in, in policy and politics. Uh, it, sometimes it feels really distant, but the truth is that, at least for now, while there's still some semblance of democracy in the country, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can go to the people who are making those decisions and tell your stories to those people and that has a real impact. Uh, we just worked with a group of firefighters to bring them, I mean firefighters, fire, sur fi fire survivors from California, and they went to D.C., they were able to speak to Bernie Sanders, they were able to speak to the majority Pelosi, um, and you know, that's a really impactful thing, it changes policy, and so if you're crafting your stories, don't just send them out onto the internet, like go and speak to policymakers. Yeah, I just have a point, so at 4 o'clock today, I'm meeting with my local council person, because I live in the in a community that is a food apartheid. And what I did is, that I'm from the Bronx, and so I told them, I said, there needs to be some sort of law passed in terms of zoning. Every block, on every block there is a fast food restaurant. Mm -hmm. We need to put some legislation that will allow a limited amount of fast food restaurants. Mm -hmm. And I'm meeting with him at four o'clock today mm -hmm. to talk about that. So we're, uh, what we need to do is think about how do we do locally the federal government and the state government, but what do we do together locally to change some of the laws and change some of the issues that we have? Now we're getting some momentum. Let's go a little further. Yeah. 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 Uh, I own a small farm in Montana, close to the Flathead Reservation, and we do a lot of outreach to uh, across the country with preference to queer people to come and be in the same space in Montana. But I realize having watched a presentation talking to people that we don't do any outreach to the Flathead Reservation that we're very close to, to get indigenous and tribal members to come and learn on our farm. So that's something that I'm hoping to change in the next few years of outreach to teach local tribal members. And people are from that. Yeah, 100%. Absolutely. Sure. Take us home. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say um, another thing is because of my program, I just had somebody come talk about voting, and I don't think it's an issue that we 
speak about enough and to get these policies to actually happen, we all have to vote. So hopefully everybody in this room is registered to vote. But the more that we vote, the better that we can get. And it's a cycle that always happens. If we can't get these policies changed because not enough of us are voting, not enough of us are actually aware of when the policy changing, what laws are being added, what laws are being taken from the policy. So we actually have to get involved, learn more, and vote more to have this actually be a full plan that's going to work and going to survive as long as we do. So that's such a beautiful point. I think that kind of helps tie up this. A good friend of mine framed activism as having these three different strategies that oftentimes we see as in conflict with each other, right? So there's the policy reform. Those are the people who are inside the system. Sometimes they get called sellouts, right? But we, we need those folks. I'll give you one example. On our farm, uh, Jillian Faison, a lawyer for the county in the youth prosecution department, was a member of our farm share. She saw how messed up the whole criminal injustice system was and how it was treating youth. But because she was an insider, we had this idea of like, oh, what if we create this farm-based alternative to incarceration, blah, 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 blah. She's like, I'm on it. I'm going to get some county legislation passed. I know the people. We, we created Project Growth. We kept 15 kids out of jail like through that program, right? But it wouldn't have worked without her. So that's, that's one part. The second sort of prong is we have the folks who are pushing from the outside of the system to dismantle corrupt things. Those are the people chaining themselves to pipelines, you know, in the redwoods, Greenpeace dropping banners. Very, very important because they're pushing the conversation in the direction of integrity. And they freak policymakers out. They're like, well, we don't want to talk to those people. Are there any moderates over here we can talk to, right? <laughs> so that's very important. And then there's folks like Soulfire. We consider ourselves the alternative institution builders. Like once you dismantle all that stuff, what are we, what are we moving towards? There's got to be a model, an example of how it can work. This is what just economy looks like. This is what carbon negative farming looks like. And oftentimes we're like, oh, who's more radical or who's more hardworking? The truth is we need all three of those things. And so I appreciate you bringing that up. Like, yes, we need to vote. It doesn't mean that you can't primarily be an institution builder or primarily be a protester. We all need to be supporting these other sort of legs of the stool, right? Latte, ete, no, no, da, these three legs of the stool. Um, so we're going to end like, thank you, we're going to end like the formal part of the presentation with a, I'm going to do a poem and I'm going to ask my sister Jermaine to help me read it. And then we still have some time. So we still have like 15 minutes or so, I think, 10, I don't know, for questions and evaluations. So if you want to leave before we're done with the questions, make sure you fill out an evaluation. But so it's going to go poem, questions, evaluation. Cool. We'll be on time. So here's the poem. So I'm going to read a line, then you read a line. Okay. See? See what you can do. Never mind, you can't tell one letter from another. Never mind, you born a slave. Never mind, you lose your name. Never mind, your daddy dead. Never mind, nothing. Here, this here, is what a man can do if he puts his mind to it and his back in it. Stop sniveling, the land said. Stop picking around the edges of the world. Take advantage, and if you can't take advantage, take disadvantage. We live here on this planet, in this nation, in this country, right here, nowhere else. We got a home in this rock, don't you see? Nobody starving in my home, not, nobody crying in my home. And if I got a home, you got one too. Grab it, grab this land. Take it, hold it, my brothers, make it, my sister, shake it, squeeze it, turn it, twist it, beat it, kick it, kiss it, whip it, thump it, dig it, plow it, seed it, reap it, rent, rent it, it, buy it, it, sell it, own it, build it, multiply it, and pass, pass it on. on. Can you hear me? Pass it on. Woo. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Y'all are amazing. I know this was so 10 of us far, black farmers went to go see this movie and then that's like one of the last lines in the movie and we were like, ah! you know, <laughs> lost our minds. <laughs> All right, we can take a few questions and then we'll do evals. Anyone have any questions, comments? We have interns who come out and they rose colored glasses and they think farming is you know, pretty awesome, but they're like, but what are you doing? Like, you're not, you're not an activist. You're not, you know, you're not on the streets, you know, being an activist for food, food rights. I'm like, I'm, I'm living that. We're doing this. We're educating the next generation how to grow. And on top of that, um, where we live is, um, we're seen as like, like we moved into a valley that was 
conventional, large-scale white ranchers. And we were, you know, they were prejudiced against us because we were hippie farmers. Like, You're not using any chemicals. <laughs> so, you know, it's taken us 10 years to really bridge that gap between us and them. And I just want to say, I think it's really important to not let others' opinions of, you know, like, like, but I guess I want to say, like, keep bridging that gap, you know, and move into a neighborhood that you don't feel comfortable, you know, and, like, try to bridge the gap with your neighbors, because for me, it's, it's been a huge advantage, and I feel like, you know, now they have a different opinion of hippie farmers and you know, organic farmers, and uh, they have respect for us just because we're farmers, and I have a better understanding of who they are. Yeah, that's a really good point, and I think sometimes, especially for folks with, like, white privilege, you know, it's so important to do that organizing right in the white community because it can seem sexy or cooler to like go into a black or brown community and try to do community gardens or something. But in fact, when you let that divide exist, even within your own family, that's why we have 45 elected is because white folks aren't doing organizing in the white community. And so I think that's really important when you're talking about, about like bridging with neighbors, you know, and we definitely have to do that at Soul Fire too. Like, We've convinced a few neighbors that climate change is real and to take down their Blue Lives Matter flags and things like that through building relationship, right, over time. And it's true, they respect, if you can work, you get some respect. Um, but also, folks with darker skin don't always have that privilege to just like move into a place you don't feel safe. So, um, so if you do have light skin privilege, like sort of take that on as your charge to <laughs> make it safe for the rest of us to um, go places, yeah? A question about your solidarity shares and how you choose or distribute where you give those shares because I I would love to do that but I feel concerned about like not having enough of them and how to choose who to give them to and do those people find you or do you find them and how do you do that? Yeah. And I don't think there's one right way. Like every community will be its own behalf. The way we happened upon it is my primary care physician who's Latin American and also on our board for not anymore but was was like noticing that when folks came and became new Americans, their diets would quickly deteriorate and they'd start getting Western illnesses because of where they were resettled through the refugee program. And so she was saying, wouldn't it be cool if there was like a point of intervention where we could just get vegetables to folks so they could keep cooking the things they always wanted to cook? And we like did some fundraising together, we sort of figured it out. So it's actually her patients that are in that program, which I'm not saying that's the best way, that just happened to be the way. And now we have relationships with them and then they recommend their neighbor and then we let them into the program, you know, so it's been more like that. Um, yeah, we try to, we do surveys and make sure we grow the foods that people want to eat. We have a lot of Southeast Asian folks in our community, so we grow a lot of those vegetables. Um, yeah. Can you please repeat the question so that we can have it in the Thank you. <laughs> Should I go back and say it or just from now? Okay. Yeah. work in nature development, which is the low income uh, development of New York City, and you often have this bad stigma to it, uh, you know, lazy people, you know, reckless thugs, this, this stigma, that stigma, even experiencing, hey, that slave work out the window when yep. I'm on the farm. So, um, and I also, um, I'm sorry, um, Mama Karen, I'm sorry, she brought up um, limiting the uh, bad food that's in these communities because all these communities have a chicken spot, pizzeria, Chinese restaurant, liquor store, all of them. So um, just limiting that, like taking that first step, I don't, um, like I'm gonna be managing my own farm next year. So in that food apartheid area, uh, there's oh, so, so, so many ways to approach uh, trying to change the mindset but when uh, a lot of people are so far removed, it's kind of like hard to take that first step or hard to uh, get people to understand you're supposed to go buy chicken every day. You're supposed to go buy pizza. It's systematic. They want you to be sick. You're 40, you're on a walker. You can't walk by yourself. Like the health problem and um, everything in New York City. So the first step is like the um, part that's kind of like, wh what do we do to get these people to uh, grasp this concept of this is what we're supposed to do. You're supposed to know what you're eating. You're supposed to uh, be aware of your health and you're supposed to be passing this on to the next generation. And you're supposed to be teaching your kids how to eat well too. So um, I just uh, 
probably some pointers on the next step or the first step to get these people to change the mindset. Word. So, in summary, the question was about what na what's your neighborhood? Uh, I'm from Staten Island. Uh, mm -hmm. So, in City. Staten Island, this neighborhood on a food apartheid, there was a shout out to Mama Karen suggesting that um, we need zoning to like limit the amount of fast food, but that also people are so um, traumatized by the history of land based oppression that there's a sense of like, oh, you're in a garden that's slave work, or you know, people have been around this food apartheid chicken spots and all for so long that that's become the new culture. And so how do we start to dismantle that? Um, which I think is a big question. And first of all, I think in the most cases, people actually want that. Like, we have an encounter that we have to convince anybody. But I'll just give you one quick one quick story to illustrate that. So, uh, Dijon Carter, young man like so many, comes out to the farm, doesn't want to get out of the van. I ain't doing no slave work. I'm no bugs, no dirt, no nothing, right? Hood up, earbuds in, have none of this. Very, very, very common to have that resistance because trauma is inherited. It actually alters your DNA. So it makes sense that you would come and see the land and be like, nah, right? But then all his buddies are going on a tour, so he would have been left alone in the van and he might have got eaten by a bear. <laughs> who you are and believe it or not there are people in the same predicament that you are in that want to have that sort of assimilation just find out you put it out I told you yesterday uh, dream <laughs> big put it out to the universe and you'll find people who are out there wanting to do the same thing that you want to do but make sure that you're never apologetic about what you are and what you bring to a community because for so long we have been smothered our voices have been smothered because we always felt that we don't have, that we somehow have to fit in. We don't have to fit in. You know what, you just do your work and believe it. When you do your work, people will be drawn to you because of the work that you're doing. Yeah. I'm gonna talk to you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we also have like 500 graduates from our program who are like looking for land and figuring out. So I feel like you can also connect yeah. to the networks. People are doing it and popping up all over the place. Okay. One more question? How do we 
we manage growth as Soul Fire. I mean, I feel like Soul Fire kind of happened to us because I started farming when I was 16 as a food project. I love farming. I didn't stop. Always wanted to farm. But when we were living in the south end of Albany, which is a neighborhood under food apartheid, we were having trouble getting vegetables for our own children, um, who are now teens. And our neighbors were like, wait, you know how to farm? You need to start a farm for the people, you know? And we found land. And, a, and at first, it was just a family farm, literally on the weekends. Like, I've been a public school teacher full time. I would deliver food on Sundays, like, you know, with my kids out of Hebrew school, all the things. Um, you know, but as people got more excited about it, my husband sold his building business when he could be more full time. We started having apprentices, you know, and it started growing and growing and growing. I'm still teaching on farm, which is nuts. I'm, I need to stop that, like, ASAP. Uh, all that to say, though, because every single step we took was because a community asked for us for it from us, like everything from the apprenticeship to the farmer training to the reparations, lab, nothing was like, oh, we're forcing this. I feel like the universe, there's been a smoothness. And if anything ever feels like that, we have to ask ourselves, who really wants this? Are we trying to impose our will on community? There's community really asking for it. But like in a practical sense, you know, our farm pays for itself. We've been very clear about that because we don't want to be like training nonprofit farmers. We want to train like farmer farmers, you know what I mean? So it's like we grow about 50, 60,000, our expenditures are about 30, that's like where we're trying to keep it so you can show that you could actually make like a kind of decent wage. Um, and we do that all through the sliding scale. And then we have a nonprofit for the educational programs and we do grants, public speaking fees, program fees to like manage that part. Um, but it's been, a, it's been a journey, like we're trying to build stuff fast as possible to house everybody and just like the infrastructure and bookkeeping, like it's been a journey. Um, but one of the reasons I wanted to write the book is to get some of that out there to share because there's no reason we all have to suffer through the same mistakes. 